Today is the fourth day of this August, September 1984 seven day retreat. Before we start working on a koan, I want to go into something somebody brought up in a meeting. It may possibly just be this one person's question, and it could very well be a question in other people's minds, maybe on the back burner, but there. Somehow I feel impelled to enter into this question. which I'm not quoting verbatim, I cannot, I don't remember it verbatim. And the importance is not to have a perfect reproduction of that question, but to formulate it so we can talk about it. Anyone is free to bring it to meetings if they wish to further ask or go into this thing. What the person asked was, why do you knock Buddhism? He seemed to be treating it like equal with other religions, which it is not. Take, for instance, said this person, the situation right now in Iran, the confusions and horrors and violence that emanate from this country. Connected with the religion there, if it was Buddhist, it wouldn't be like that. First of all, let me say that I'm not knocking whatever that word precisely means. Putting down, or have ever put down, any of the sayings of the Buddha. Those that I understand in translation, there are many unclear translations. The Buddha's teaching, as I see it, was to understand oneself profoundly, clearly, to see the truth of oneself, to understand it profoundly and in that understanding go beyond, to take refuge in the truth and in nothing other than the truth, and nothing on nobody other than the truth. How can that be knocked? There's nothing to knock there. What I was concerned with when this new center was founded was not the content of Buddhism, but the danger in human beings being attached to and identified with larger entities, isms, nationalities, religious groups, cults, ideologies, anything that the small self, the me which feels insufficient, anxious, lonely, unsure of itself and separate, clings to, to 
aggrandize itself, make itself feel more secure, secure, belonging, and so forth. And with this separation of humankind happens. Separation into this and this and this and this and this religion or ideology or nationality. And among these different entities exists rivalry, friction, strife, in all, to all degrees. I only need to remind of bloody confrontations in Ireland where it is not two religions but two, two Christian factions want to call it that, I don't know the technical term. In the Middle East were not only three adherents of three religious, great religions fight each other, but within each religion there are factions that fight each other too, fighting for supremacy, power, control. There is religious warfare going on among the once non-violent Hindus and Pakistanis. There's violent confrontation in the Buddhist country of Ceylon with the indigenous population of the Tamil. One, one can name it and see it everywhere where human beings are identified with for their security with a larger group and with that comes personal identity means the group is me and if the group is attacked verbally or otherwise I am attacked I'm personally feeling wounded hurt and called to defend even give my life for it. For what this group gives me, an identity, sometimes it's just the flattering of one's vanity to be a such and such versus a such and such. Gives one something to live for, to propagate, to proselytize. Human beings do flock together on the basis of their isms and attach attachments to groups. Just heard of a woman going to move here. She asked that a house be found for her where the neighbors are Christian. Jews want to live in the vicinity with Jews. I remember one time reading a letter written by a Buddhist monk who said it is so good finally to come to a country, it was Burma, where 90% of the population is Buddhist. How good it feels. This was an American. The fact that particularly intense violence flares up in certain religions may not be due to that particular religion. One must look at things globally. A little while ago in a country, largely Christian, which produced some of the greatest composers, poets, playwrights, philosophers, and scientists. The greatest holocaust that the world has ever witnessed took place. 
It is a human disease that flares up once here and then there and we don't know where it's going to flare up tomorrow. It will flare up as long as a human being does not understand attachment, the need to belong, and does not face squarely, honestly and courageously, if we may use that word, the insufficiency, feelings of insufficiency, loneliness, separation that arise from the feeling of self, of being an individual entity, and the escapes that are automatically reached for and clung to. People say to me, what about your organization? I wish to disclaim ownership <laughs> of the GVZC. <laughs> Or people say, your students also have all kinds of beliefs. I have no students. I don't own students. We come together as friends. At least friendship is here, whether you feel this way toward me, I don't know. It's up to you how you see me. And we work on dropping images so that this friendship can start to, to flourish among us, not as you as my disciples or students and I as your teacher, but as human beings coming together to look at themselves and to see if there can be freedom from this disease we have just pointed out. So people have asked from the beginning, what about your organization? Isn't it just a substitute religion or whatever? It is not. It is not a substitute anything. It is not trying to substitute for any ism or religious belief or ceremony. It was founded so there would be this opportunity to work together, talk together, listen to talks, and hold retreats. Maybe here and there a dance or a potluck dinner. Whether or not people identify with this organization is each individual's problem. It becomes a problem, one can see that. And it is pointed out as often as it comes to mind what identifying is, where it arises from, and the dangers of it, of then feeling better or superior to someone in another organization, and rivalry, friction, the whole business. We've all been through it, but it arises again and again if it becomes clouded over. So we point it out again and again. I tried for the longest time in meetings to avoid this category of membership. It would have been to my liking if there was no membership, but somehow or other it became clear there has to be some organized way in which people support the work that goes on here, which cannot go on without financial support. So, members are people who financially support this place and nothing more. What one makes out of it is for oneself to observe. The place is not restricted to members. Anyone can work and yet if somebody comes to retreat, have to pay. If a person can't pay, we'll make arrangements. But it is not created for an in-group. There's nothing exclusive about this work at all. It 
concerns each and every individual who wishes to do this difficult work of facing oneself as one is. and questioning whether there is the possibility of freedom from this conditioned mind which breeds disease after disease. Not just on an individual level, but on a large scale, as witnessed throughout the world. true that members of this group have individual superstitions and beliefs. This was also mentioned to me. Your, your students aren't free from beliefs in this or that. I don't want to list it all. Yeah. It is so. If somebody opens it up, we talk about it and look at it. It is not fostered by me or protected or promoted. And if it is, please bring it to my attention. What about the name Zen in our, in the name of this organization? It took many, many sessions and meetings with many, many people to to agree on a name. We had to have a name legally to incorporate because we could have incorporated as the nameless society or something. <laughs> <laughs> there were many such suggestions <laughs> which would have been sort of heavy in a way. <laughs> Try to carry a message right in your name. but. <laughs> but it was generally agreed that to describe what we're doing, which is impossible to describe, and using some of the things we use, like the cushions and the, uh, uh, the bell, albeit we use it very little these days, the block, and the general structure of meetings and talk and koan for those who wish to work on koan. Zen was the most descriptive word. A descriptive word, not a word denoting, denoting, how do you say, allegiance or um, connection with Buddhism. Personally, if you observe or listen to the way I talk, I don't think I ever use the word Zen, except if I read a text and it appears. It is not particularly meaningful to me. It is not particularly useful. There's a lot of associations with it which it are not needed, which are harmful when one wants to look into oneself beyond all associations that are already there as a well-functioning electrical network or electronic network. In the little book that came out, I've explained the word Zen as coming from the Indian word, word dhyana, which means meditation. And it was also thought about calling this place a meditation center, and there were many people that spoke against it, because meditation, too, has a lot of associations, which at the time we felt were undesirable to have in the name. We may have a different name sometime. We're very flexible in these things and not rigidly attached or crystallized in one name or process.
people have further questions about this misunderstandings or whatever, please bring them up in the meeting. The koan is again from the collection of Mumon Khan and it's called Daitsu Chishu, which is the name of a what I call a legendary Buddha long before the time of the historical Buddha. It's supposed to have been infinite series or successions of, of, of Buddhas in the non-historical past. Daitsu Chishu being one of them. The Koan says, once a monk said to a teacher, a Zen teacher, Daitsu Chishu Buddha did Zazen in a meditation hall for ten kalpas. Ten kalpas is infinite time. Longer than seven days. <laughs> <laughs> The truth was not manifested, nor did he attain Buddhahood. <clears throat> Why was it? And the reply was, your question is splendid indeed. And the monk persisted. But he did practice Zazen on a body seat. Why did he not attain Buddhahood? And the reply was because he didn't. Mumon's Commentary is the old foreigner may understand it, but he cannot really know it. An ordinary man, if he or she, or ordinary woman, if he or she understands, is a sage. A sage if he or she knows, is an ordinary human being. And the poem reads, rather than give the body relief, give relief to the mind. When the mind is at peace, the body is not distressed. When mind and body are set free, why would the holy seek to become lordly? Rather than give the body relief, give relief to the mind. When the mind is at peace, the body is not distressed. If mind and body are both set free, why would the holy seek to become lordly? The scene is about a seeker. One has to, with a koan, one has to really feel and live oneself into the scene that is given and into each, each one that appears in the scene to the extent that one is capable of doing this, which means no preconceived ideas, but to just feel it out crawl into all these different skins, as it were.
because they're one's own skin. It is always ultimately about oneself because oneself is not different from someone who lived in 9th century China or 20th century China. Russia, South Africa, England, or America, you name it, human beings seek something. Success, money, position, security, belonging. To become something. That's what this koan is all about, about becoming. It doesn't spell it out, but this is the way I see it. In the Zen Buddhist tradition, becoming a Buddha is the goal, which is held out for every human being, the possibility of becoming a Buddha. meaning a liberated human being. A free human being. Not attached to anything or anyone. And yet not withdrawn or isolated, but full of love, compassion, and intelligence to see and think for oneself as the situation arises. So human beings, we said, are alike everywhere, seeking something seeking out of this feeling of incompletion, insufficiency, inadequacy, insecurity. Often the feeling of being so isolated, so cut off, from even one's closest friends or family, even from the beauty of nature. As one person put it, I sort of see it with the eyes, but the isolation is there, meaning a beautiful landscape. I can appreciate it was said, I can appreciate it, the person said, but the isolation is felt. And this is how most human beings live the world over and have lived since time immemorial. And seeking outside of themselves for something to fill this inner void or gratify this never gratified, never satisfied feeling of self. Trying out everything. The worldly and the holy. In quotation marks. <clears throat> And here is a monk, one can assume, has sat for a long time with lots of ideas of what he would attain or could attain or should attain. And then coming upon some scripture in which he reads about this ancient Buddha who sat for kalpas and didn't make it. Mm -hmm. 
didn't manifest the truth, didn't attain Buddhahood. One can feel the state of mind and body of this, of this person. If he didn't, how could I possibly attain? And that's what my life is dedicated to. And I don't want to sit for kalpas. <laughs> I want to get there a little bit faster, but first I want to understand why didn't he get it? Because maybe if I understand why he didn't get it, maybe I realize it's no use for me to even try and put all this energy into it. Maybe I'd rather have some fun, go back to the world, <laughs> enjoy myself. could be that this alternative was not in his mind of quitting the whole thing, but just totally perplexed as to why this ancient Buddha sitting and sitting and sitting didn't attain it. A totally incomprehensible thing and wanting an explanation for it. The question is there, the perplexity is there, and there is a teacher there whom one can ask. Maybe he can give an answer to satisfy or dissolve this perplexity. Give one a new boost, <coughs> new understanding. and. The answer he is getting is, your question is splendid indeed. Which, the, the, this translation is, sounds as though it was a glib answer. It could, could have been, it's, it's a good question. Or one could have repeated the question with him. Yes, why, why didn't he attain Buddha? to keep the question alive, the question of attaining, the question of time, the question of me becoming that, wanting to become that. But the monk did not feel understood it's very difficult not to get an answer and yet realize that someone who doesn't give the answer is still with one. Because we're so conditioned to feel that we only understood, our question is only understood if we get an answer. And that may be the very <laughs> not understanding of the question, giving an answer. It, it can, this can happen on a very superficial level, on a wordy level. One takes the question and gives a wordy answer. And this is how we usually communicate with each other. So often if one observes conversations, somebody asks a question of you and the person doesn't even often wait for the answer. The, the fact that when one says something is already enough. Because it's just, maybe one just wants to be in verbal touch with another human being. Because one doesn't know any other touch, any other communication or communion. So here the monk feels not understood, and he repeats his question, maybe with more intensity, but why didn't he? He sat there for such an infinitely long time and didn't attain Buddhahood. Why didn't he? And 
here the answer is he didn't. The koan ends there. And one wonders whether this was the beginning of looking into this whole thing for the monk of trying to become something. And who is the one that is trying? Who is the seeker? We're so preoccupied all the time with what we're seeking or searching for and yet oblivious and ignorant of him or her who is searching or seeking. Who is that? What is it? What is seeking? What is becoming? Doesn't it all involve ideas? One has to scrutinize this because one may take so much for granted that there is such a thing as emancipation, freedom, enlightenment, Buddhahood, salvation, and not realize that these are really concepts, ideas, which one has taken over from others, books or teachers, spoken words. and assumes that this is that this exists somewhere in the future without questioning what is the future it's often not questioned even in religious teaching it's future is used the future is used Enlightenment, if not in this lifetime, then in another lifetime. And what happens meanwhile? Salvation at the end of this life. Or I'm not a student of comparative religion, but as long as the human mind creates these religions, which it has and does, it must be the same all over. Use of imagination, faith, belief, and the future goal to which one, taught which one strives or in which one believes and does certain prescribed practices to get there, or belief in a mediator who will get one there. All of which in invented by the human mind, by thought, coming out of this feeling of insufficiency, loneliness, inadequacy, inner emptiness, void. You can say there have been divine revelations, but what is a divine revelation? But the product of human thought. It is for you, if you believe in it, to test it out, to question it at least. Not to take everything over that comes at one. We have done it already for thousands of years. So who is the seeker? Who 
who produces the future by thinking about it. Thought creates the future based on what is remembered from the past, the teachings, the ideas, the concepts. One projects them into what one calls the future. It's thought production. Can one see that? Really struggle with it to understand it? I don't mean struggle in terms of conflict, but to need to understand that, to be clear about the nature of time and whether there is such a thing as a future at all when thought does not project it. Or whether there is only at all instance this now. Not as a concept, but as a living reality. And what is now? This is what one needs to, to face from moment to moment. The seeking, the wanting. What is that? One doesn't explain it, analyze it, describe it according to what one has heard described, but one, one, one is that, one, one, one faces it, one is, one is that. Facing is still a dualistic term. Or a better way of putting it maybe, the mind quieting in the presence of this drive to seek for something just listening to it with no prejudice for or against it. Not, I heard her say we shouldn't seek. Then one is separate, one is in, in memory of what one thinks somebody said. But what is this energy of seeking, wanting or not wanting? as directly experienced, <clears throat> with no interpretation, <clears throat> no nothing, just that. One may notice surreptitiously there is an image or thought of something one wants, worldly or spiritually, and then the, the seeking, the wanting, the desiring is directed toward that idea and again away from what's happening here right now, the feeling of inner agony, pain of emptiness. And why can't that be? Faced without a facer. Felt, listened to. As it is, without making a big thing out of it or a little thing out of it, it's what it is. What is it? opening up. Which means no defense, ready to, to feel the, the pain of it or the, the fear of it, and moving with it. Is it in order to find something at the bottom of it? Then 
there's again an idea to see that and can it be dropped when one if one works like this one one notices it what gets in the way what distracts it's not the truck the garbage truck that distracts it's all our ideas of what we we want that distracts away from what is the wanting is there can that itself be plumbed silently quietly motionlessly without thinking of a result a success or a failure that is irrelevant it is our old conditioning that's what it is fear of failure or expecting success can it be seen instantly as it rears its head this is the work to to illuminate illumine every crack of this unconscious mind every niche every movement of it every phase of it for no purpose other than doing it and the seeing of it the feeling the awareness of it is is already the the first step of freedom from it Not freedom as an idea, but one isn't blindly, darkly, unconsciously run by it the moment one notices something. It may be that there is nothing to attain, nothing to become, and that the full realization of that is the freedom. Freedom, if we want to put it that way, from the compulsion to attain and to become from time. In the future I will. But it, that also is the, the, the quieting of the mind, because if you watch the mind, what it is agitated with, a lot of the time is seeking, wanting, becoming. Away from what is. And just to be with what is, in quietness, without agitation, wanting to change it or leap over it or conquer it. No, no such goal, 
no such movement. Then what is? What is? What is it? What is there? When the mind is quiet. Some people at times say to me, your teaching is idealistic because it always seems to hold up a state of the quiet mind, the silent mind, the free mind, the mind that doesn't seek. It's not held up as an ideal, it's a question. Is that possible? And then to find out for oneself by looking squarely into the agitation, into the unfreedom, the tiredness, the attachments, to understand them deeply. Superficially, I call it verbally. Intellectually, deeply, I mean be in touch with it as it feels. And and sounds and is directly experienced without judgment. Ideals are a hindrance, and a barrier, because then we want that. But that can, if this takes place due to how one has listened to or heard what has been said, if that takes place, then it's all up for observation. No one prevents one from observing that. That the mind immediately makes an ideal out of what has been heard and wants that and is on its way away from where one is. Namely, well, where are you? Where are we? The commentary says, the old foreigner may understand it, but cannot really know it. What is a foreigner? recently arriving at the airport in New York after having come from abroad one could tell who was a foreigner because people were sort of lost in this incredible confusion which was Kennedy Airport at that moment I don't know whether it's always like that but it was I wondered how anybody could make heads or tails of it particularly if you don't understand the language, don't understand the custom customs, the hunting, the competitive hunting for carts to put the luggage on, first come, first serve, and practically it's pulled out from under you. So a foreigner is someone who doesn't know the customs of the country, who doesn't know who's, who's new at it. And his or her old conditioning doesn't apply here. I'm not knocking America, please. It, it happens to one if one uh, uh, lands in a airports in another country. So foreigner here, of course, in, in Buddhist, Tradition it often refers to Bodhidharma who came as an Indian to China, sitting and not talking very much. After an initial interview with the emperor who didn't understand, he just left and sat. 
but foreigner in itself is enough. One who doesn't know, one whose conditioning is useless. And therefore one has to use something new. New insight, new understanding. And here it says, understanding is not knowing. And we've talked about this. Seeing something is not thinking about it or knowing it. These are two entirely different processes. Knowing is translating what is seen into language and then communicating it. But the one who listens to the communication, if one just listens to the words, that's not understanding. That's knowing it, if the word is used this way, we're using it this way. So, at times when there is a, a deep insight or understanding, one has no words to, to describe it. They come later. And they're never adequate, never, never, can never possibly cover or express adequately because with nothing. Cannot possibly describe adequately in words what one inhalation is. The word inhalation is not volumes of words can't ever completely describe what this is. This is why it's such a marvelous thing if there's is the possibility of just plain attending, letting it come into awareness as it is without words, without understanding it, uh, knowing it. Then one may realize one has been doing this all one's life and never attended once completely to this, whatever it is. Here Mumon says, an ordinary person, if he or she understands it, is a sage. What he's trying to say, there's no Kalpa, Kalpa length duration of becoming that Buddha, but understanding now one is a sage. And yet, why label? <laughs> this is just giving a person a new image to hang on to. It wasn't his intention, I'm sure, but it happens. If there's an inkling of an understanding here, and one feels an ancient, revered Zen master calls me a sage, boy! <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one isn't that naive, <laughs> but one must not trust image formation, but watch it. It happens like mushrooms in the moist soil of a forest. You come up, one knows not where from. There they are. I picked them all yesterday, and here they are again. And then he says, a sage, if he only knows, is an ordinary man. Meaning the moment that one starts just mouthing what somebody else experienced or what oneself experienced in the past without the, the depth of understanding being there, the words coming out of that, then, well, what's wrong with an ordinary person? It's, a, 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 it's used as a label for someone who doesn't understand. Well, he uses it this way, so we go along with it. What he's maybe trying to show here is the quick flip-flop, an instant of understanding, and then all of a sudden one is embroiled again in, in something, wanting a piece of pie or something. At 
the instant one sees the greed for a piece of pie or something, or wanting what somebody else has, if it's seen, not just telling oneself, yeah, I'm a greedy person, that, that does nothing except that it depresses one while one goes on. <laughs> Seeing is more than labeling oneself. It's really coming in touch with, with the whole movement of greed. How it has the body captive. The whole body has it, it has it captive, and the mind too. And if one pauses, and just sort of inwardly faces that, pardon the word facing, it is not a dualistic process. One is that. Then something new is happening. A rupture has taken place at that instant. A rupture of an old program which one shares with all human beings. One is not alone in that. Maybe we'll, we'll keep the verse for tomorrow. A lot can be said about it. And we'll end here for today.